Good morning and welcome to Trinity Lutheran Church. It is not good that we are not here. It is not good that we are not here, but it's not the end of the world either. We have on occasion canceled uh, worship services, but this is not a corona blizzard. This is not a one-week event. This is not about plowing the snow and moving on in a few days. This will be a season of weathering the corona storm, riding out the storm that life might return to a more normal state. I was reading a reflection from a ship captain who said, even the fiercest storm gives way to calmer seas. It can be hard to envision calmer seas in the midst of a storm, but we will get there and we will get there together. But for now, we are here and you are home. And that is where most of you need to be at this point, home. We now have volunteers that are happy to grocery shop for you and deliver food to your home. There'll be an email regarding this service on Monday. You can also call the church office if this service would be helpful to you. Now, if you take a moment, look around the sanctuary. There's no one here. Just me, Carl, Laura, and Dwight. We have canceled worshiping together for the sake of public safety and out of concern for the most vulnerable Trinity Lutheran Church family members. But we have not canceled church. No, we continue to be church together. Your church council and your church staff will be working with a group of Trinity Lutheran Church members to serve those who are shut in, to help those who feel isolated, to deliver food, and to offer hope in a season of quarantine. We are the church. We are the church together, loved, forgiven, and never alone. We will weather this storm, and we will weather it together. Listen now to a reading from the prophet Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, he who created you, he who formed you, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God, your Savior. You are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. Beautiful words. I read those words a few days ago to a woman from our parish who is in the final chapter of her life. She is in hospice care. She does not leave her room anymore. A small bed surrounded by her family. Her world has become very small. But it was not always that way. We talked about her younger years. We remember different seasons in her life. Falling in love, having children, moving to Seattle, downhill skiing. The precious memories brought a beautiful smile to her face. It helped her for a moment to escape her current circumstances, to reflect on the wonderful blessings of her life. On this, the Lord's Day, I would encourage you to find a reason to smile. Count your blessings. Reflect upon the journey of your life. Give thanks to God for seasons in the sun and life on Whidbey Island. Carl is going to sing a song that might help us to do just that. A standard from the American songbook, this song written by Charlie Chaplin in 1936. Smile though your heart is aching, smile even though it's breaking, though there are clouds in the sky you'll get by. If you smile through your fears and sorrow, smile and maybe tomorrow you'll see the sun come shining through for you. 
Light up your face with gladness, hide every trace of sadness, although a tear may be ever so near. That's the time you must keep on trying. Smile, what's the use of crying? You'll find that life is still worthwhile if you'll just smile. Light up your face with gladness, hide every trace of sadness, although a tear may be ever so near. That's the time you must keep on trying. Smile, what's the use of crying? You'll find that life is still worthwhile if you'll just smile. Thank you, Carl. Thank you for that beautiful piece of music. It indeed did bring a smile to our face. Now at the end of the sermon, Carl is going to sing for us. This song will be one that he wrote. And during the sermon, if you would, I would ask you to please hold your applause till the end. Every three years, we encounter three long stories during Lent. The stories come from the Gospel of John. Last week, it was Nicodemus. This week, the woman at the well. And next week, a man who was born blind. Yogi Berra, the great Yankee catcher, manager, and Hall of Famer said, you can observe a lot by just watching. Now my grandsons are the apple of my eye, the source of untold joy and exhaustion. Cam gave me the name Bapa. He calls Felicia Gigi. Cam and Cooper, they are brothers and playmates and competitors. They are friends and they are adversaries. When our family was together after Christmas, the boys were swimming in the pool with their dad while their mother, their Gigi, and their papa soaked in a jacuzzi tub. Cam came over to see us. His water wings were still on. We invited him to get in and join us in the hot tub. He said that the jacuzzi was not for kids, but we assured him that it would be all right. After all, there had been other children in the jacuzzi all day. Reluctantly, he got in. The warm water felt good on his little body. Just then, a uniformed member of the resort staff approached us. Politely, he told us that children were not allowed in the jacuzzi. We thanked him and started to get out. But for Cam, it was different. He struck out at his mother. He burst uncontrollably into tears. He said, you told me it was okay. Why did you do that, Mom? Mom carried him to his daddy, and they sat in a pool chair for the better part of the next hour. Cam never stopped crying. He hid his head, he hid his face under a pool towel and buried his head into his daddy's chest. The next day, the sun came out, a new day. The sun was out, the air was warm, Cooper was already in the pool with his Gigi, but Cam would not go anywhere near the water. He said, I'm not allowed to go in the pool. He said with his head hung low, and we assured him that he was, it was okay. He could go in the pool. That's right, that would be the same people who told him that it was okay for him to go in the jacuzzi. He would have no part of it. Finally, his daddy carried him to the front desk, to the people in uniform. Uniforms mean a lot to three-year-old boys. Michael asked if Cam was old enough to go in the pool. He asked if Cam could have their permission to go in the pool. The front desk uniforms assured him that it was okay. That was January 2nd, 2020. Fast forward now to February 18th. A sunny day in the Northwest, a beautiful day on Whidbey Island. I wanted to take Cam and Cooper out for a bike ride. After all, Cam was sporting a new red bike that Santa had left him. But the road is hilly and Cooper at 16 months of age is pretty much just scoots around on his little bike. 
So we loaded the bikes into my golf cart and we worked our way down to the useless Bay Country Club. The tennis courts there are flat and safe. Big fences, no cars. Both boys would be perfectly safe there. No one was playing on the courts, so I took the boys on the tennis courts. Cooper scooted around and Cam was off racing on the court. And then after one lap, he, he got off his bike and he said, my leg hurts, Papa. I'm going to go sit in the golf cart. I said, what? How did you hurt your leg? He said, my leg just hurts. I'm going to the golf cart. I picked up Cooper and we walked out with Cam. And as soon as we got outside of the fence, Cam looked at the sign that was hanging there. He couldn't read it, of course. He's only three years old. But he looked at that sign and he said to me, that says kids are not supposed to be in here, doesn't it, Papa? The shame from the jacuzzi was still there. Shame, self-imposed shame in a three-year-old. Yes, shame is powerful and shame is destructive. You can observe a lot by just watching. Our lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of John, the fourth chapter. Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar. Jacob's well was there and Jesus tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. The scorching sun was high in the midday sky. A Samaritan woman came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman, perplexed, said to Jesus, Sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give them will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, go, go call your husband and come back. The woman's head bowed low as she said, I have no husband. Jesus said, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. The woman said, sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. The hour is come and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. God is spirit, and those who worship God must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah is coming, but Jesus said, I am he, the one who is speaking to you right now. Just then the disciples came near, and they were astonished, maybe even more than astonished that Jesus was speaking with a woman. Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. And she implored the people of Zychar saying, come, come and see a man who told me everything that I had ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city with her and they were on their way to see Jesus. Many Samaritans believed in Jesus because of this woman's testimony. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Two weeks in a row, two fascinating stories. And Jesus is center stage in both. But the characters he shared the stage with were as different as night and day. Last week a man, this week a woman. Last week a man with a name, Nicodemus. This week a woman who has no name, or at least no name was recorded or remembered. She was simply the woman at the well. Nicodemus was a respected leader, 
The woman at the well was a scorned outcast. Last week, we encountered a man of great power. This week, a woman who is absolutely powerless. A Pharisee and a Samaritan. One is confident, one has no confidence. One meets Jesus under the cover of night. One meets Jesus in the blazing heat of noontime. Nicodemus sought Jesus out. The woman was hiding out at the well. Nicodemus arrives full of energy, ready for a debate. But the woman is tired out. She's weary from a long, dreary life marked by loneliness and disappointment and shame. One was a trusted advisor of the people. The other suffers in shame. Let's unpack the story a little bit and see what God has to say to us. Great crowds had been following Jesus. Where, where, where were they now? People had been pressing in on Jesus. Well, where were they now? And the disciples, they always seemed to be nearby, but they weren't now. Where were they? No, there were only two people at the well at high noon. It was a private encounter between Jesus and a Samaritan woman. And it was in every way highly inappropriate. There were only two people at the well. Or were there more? Perhaps there were others there. If so, who were they? Jesus and his disciples were on a road trip. They were traveling between Judea and the Galilee. That was not unusual at all. But our story takes place in a most peculiar place. This was not where anyone would have expected to find Jesus and his disciples. They are in Samaria, a land that was to be avoided at all costs. For living in Samaria were the Samaritans, and Jews and Samaritans held each other in utter contempt. Both Jewish and Samaritan religious leaders taught that it was wrong to have any contact with the opposite group. They were not to enter each other's territory or even talk to each other. In some ways, the Middle East has not changed a lot in 2,000 years. Typically, if Jews were traveling between Judea and the Galilee, they would just go around Samaria. But for some reason, that was not the case this time. Jesus came to the Samaritan city, and outside the city, there was a well called Jacob's Well. Jesus was tired out by his journey, and so his disciples went into town to find food. Jesus rested by the well. It was about noon. The time was not inconsequential. It has great meaning. A Samaritan woman approached the well, water jar on her shoulder. Now this too was strange. Why? Because there were wells inside the city, conveniently located near her house. The women of the town would typically get their water in the cool of the morning or at the end of the day as evening shadows began to lengthen. This ritual was practical. Practical. You got to have water, right? Yes. But it was also a planned social outing. At the well, they gathered with other women. There they were free to speak about the challenges of raising their children and their husbands. This is what people did before Facebook. The well was more than a watering hole. It was a meeting place, a place each day to connect where lives came together. There was laughing and sharing, tender embraces, and occasionally a few tears among the women who gathered there to get water. And then the women would return home with the water in hand, refreshed to meet the challenges of another day. So why? Why would this Samaritan woman walk out of the city in the heat of the day to fill her water jar? Why would she pass the city wells and draw her water in solitude at the well that was only frequented by those who were passing by, by those who did not know her name and did not know her story? Why? Because this was a broken woman. Five times she had been married, and now she was living with a man who was not her husband. What happened? 
What had happened to her? Had her five husbands died? Was she five times divorced, rejected? Or maybe it was a combination of death and divorce or just bad luck or bad choices. We don't really know what the circumstances were that had put her in this position. But we can only imagine her pain. For she had experienced the sorrow of five relationships that either did not work out or ended in tragedy. What tremendous pain this woman must have been carrying with her to the well. And if those burdens were not enough, now she was an outcast among her own people. And when Jesus met her there, we must note that he did not condemn her. He did not judge her. He did not ask her to explain her brokenness. Her past would not stop Jesus from calling her to new life. Maybe there was hope for her. Maybe, just maybe, her life was worth living. The conversation was the beginning of new life for her. Jesus talked to her. And before the story was over, what happened? The entire village was talking to her again. You see, this simple grace led to a miracle. Yes, this woman at the well was resurrected by the love of Jesus. She was every bit as dead as Lazarus, a walking corpse. And now she had exchanged Grave clothes of shame for party clothes of new birth. She could now leave the well of her hiding. She could show her face again and return to her community. In a simple grace, Jesus had declared her worthy. Jesus had declared his love for her. Jesus met her at the well just when she thought no one cared just when she thought that no one could possibly love her. She came to the well in shame, carrying so many burdens. She came carrying a heavy water jar. And when she walked away, she left the water jar behind. She left the jar. She left the shame. She left the self-loathing. She left the past. She walked home with a bounce in her step. And so I might ask you, have you ever been to that well? Maybe you've been there recently, hiding out, covering your face with a pool towel, ashamed, disgraced, feeling disconnected from your family, your friends, your church, your God, afraid to show your face when shopping at Payless. And so you go at night or early in the morning hoping not to be seen. Have you ever been to that well? Driven out of town and out of sight by heartfelt pain, the pain of divorce that leaves families in ruin and our dreams adrift, the pain of losing a lifetime mate and the reality of the loneliness that follows? Have you ever been to that well, feeling lost and alone because of an addiction, keeping secrets, and hoping not to be found out? Ever been to that well, knowing that you're being judged by your community, that heads turn and tongues wag whenever you enter a room, your life discussed by those who have no compassion for you? Ever been to that well, fleeing the world because of the guilt that you carry, consumed by despair because of your past, weighed down by your mistakes and the selfish decisions that were yours? Ever been there? Of course you have. We've all been there. You see, the woman at the well is our sister. In fact, she looks right back at us in the mirror every day. Her reflection is our reflection, for she reflects the brokenness of God's people. At first glance, it seemed that it was only Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well that day. But now that our eyes have been opened, we see just how, how crowded it is. For at that well, Jesus meets us. And that is the beauty of the gospel. Jesus picks us up and invites us to shake off the guilt and shame, to leave the water jars behind, and to be resurrected to new life. 
when no one else welcomes us, Jesus does. When no one else forgives us, Jesus does. When no one else cares, Jesus cares. And when no one else will touch us, Jesus does. My friends, life is too short to carry a load of shame. Shame disables us. Shame keeps us from getting in the pool. Shame keeps us from living God's abundant life. So let go of the shame. You're not perfect. Join the club. You have a checkered past, join the club. You live with regret, just like the rest of us. So learn from the past. Learn from the journey, and then let it go. Jesus promises us forgiveness. Let go of the shame. And do not inflict shame on others. There's no room for self-righteousness. All stories are human stories. And all stories include moments of brokenness. So let us give up shame for Lent. Carl's going to sing for us. So how is it now that you should suffer in shame? For have we not heard the words that bring release? You are called beyond the terror by the one who knows your name. God's living water brings the truth of grace to our days. Isn't it you, an outcast by our fear? Yes, it's true, you have no welcome here, for you are sprung from different stock than us, and but a woman too. And surely you must know by now that grace is for the few. So how is it now that you should suffer in shame? For have we not heard the words that speak release? You are called beyond the sadness by the one who knows your name, God's living water brings the truth of grace to our days. Isn't it sad the way they live their days? The hue of their love, it speaks of different ways. And yes, we've heard the words that Jesus says, now what are we to do? How can we accept the way you are? Can there be Christ in you? So how is it now that you should suffer in shame? For have we not heard the words that speak release? You are called beyond the silence by the one who knows your name. God's living water brings the truth of grace to our days. So isn't it funny? blinded by a fall. The various ways we hear our Maker's call, and though we seek the way of God to live, we cannot know them all. We walk by faith and worship God in spirit and in truth. So how is it now that we should suffer in shame? For have we not heard the words that speak release? We are called beyond the silence by the one who knows our name. 
God's living water brings the truth of grace to our days. We are called now into wholeness by the one who knows our name. God's living water brings the truth of grace to our days. Thank you once again, Carl, for sharing that beautiful song with us. And I, we hope that this, uh, this service coming to your home is a blessing to you. I would invite you now to just uh, unite our hearts in prayer uh, across media. Unite our hearts in prayer as we pray together as Jesus taught us. Please join me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I would encourage you this week to continue to look for emails and post as we will be communicating you, with you pretty much daily out of the church office. And for now, I'll send you off in this way. Stay in the place that you are. Love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have a great day.